Okay, so last night I dreamed that it wasn't real. It was all a tape recording. I found myself standing near a dumpster in a back alley. It was late at night, and a warm wind wafted loose sheets of paper around me. Looking down this alley and across another laneway, I saw a door. Above this door was written, in curving blue neon lights, the word silencio. And then a taxi pulls into view, stops in front of the entrance, and lets out two women. Both are blonde. One wears a black dress, and the other, who's a little shorter than the first, is kitted out in a red cardigan and black skirt. As the taxi pulls away, I have an urge to join these women. I sprint down the alley, meet them at the door's threshold, and together we enter Silencio. Inside is a playhouse, the old-timey kind, with balconies and galleries facing a stage, divided front from back with a tall red velvet curtain. As I amble along the mezzanine, looking for a seat, I hear a false silence that sounds like a string orchestra, an organ, grinding a slowly rising bass figure. At stage left is a pensive-looking man in a black suit. He's standing in shadows, hard dark eyes glaring at the floor, waiting, it seems, for a cue. I find a seat, and as I'm about to sit, the man in shadows promptly declares, No, I, Banda, there is no band. Then a reverb sodden clarinet begins to play in a mawkish, noir-like blues theme, accompanying the man as he moves to center stage and towards a vintage microphone, coruscating with the silver beams of a single spotlight. Il n'y a pas d'orchestre, he continues. With a flourish of his right hand, he conjures a walking cane. Then, stopping momentarily, cane held aloft, he tells me in a near whisper, this is all a tape recording. As though resuming a sermon, he repeats, no, I banda, and yet, pointing the cane to his ear, we hear a band. Indeed, I say to myself, the band plays, I hear it. The women I followed in here hear it. We all hear the band, but it's true. There is no band. As the man says, it is all a recording. It is an illusion. At this point, I begin to consider what it means that it is all recorded. And then I start to wonder if Joan Baudrillard may have been one of Fernando Pessoa's heteronyms, and what it would be like were he having this dream. In this reverie, I, or rather he, would decide that these declarations are poetic injunctions and their demonstration on stage the play of an impossible exchange. A theater performance composed of ruses, exploding sound capacity to simulate presence or equally to dissimulate absence, he would say, seems to portray equivalence between the revealed truth of the situation, it is all recorded, and the technological artifice that produces this truth, it is all recorded. <laughs> However, he would immediately clarify that truth and artifice are not equivalent. This digital verity, the is or is not of the situation, can't keep count in silencio. When a trumpeter arrives on stage and shows us that he's doing not what he appears to be doing, and especially when a woman wearing a jeweled tear, standing alone at the microphone, dolefully sings Roy Orbison's crying in Spanish and faints, but continues to sing in a voice that may or, not, may, or may not belong to her, truth and artifice do not tally. The recursive count, rather than managing the immeasurable threat of the situation, as counting is meant to do, afflicts it with a certain delirium, much like what happens to Alice when the White Queen asks her, what's one and one and one and one and one and one and one? She loses count. The statement, it is all an illusion, perpetrates the equivalence of truth and artifice because it counts both terms at the same time with the same unit. Like two lines passing through a single point, truth and artifice exchange their negative characteristics in the statement of their accounting and, in a way, conceal how one must always be more than one in order to avoid being less than one. Truth and artifice show themselves as one thing only in being counted with another thing that can be counted as one. And since one must be able to count two things as one for either of them to count as one, the truth or fiction that it is all recorded is always a more than one that is less than one. It then occurs to me, as well as the imaginary pataposition, that we're in Club Silencio, and there is no band. There's no sign or count of music, yet we hear a band. The music floats uncertainly, but clearly in the mockery of a silence that is not. How do you exchange sound and silence, I ask my wool-gathering figment? What does it mean that there is no band when it is all recorded? When sound and silence fail to be each other's difference because this is all a tape recording, then what's left for them to do? And he answers, 
When it is all recorded, there is nothing left to do. Something is already spoken for. He then reminds me of something that the Taoist sage Zhuangzi wrote during the time of the Hundred Schools of Thought. To use a horse to show that a horse is not a horse is not as good as using a non-horse to show that a horse is not a horse. And it dawns on him, who is me, a butterfly is not a horse. And then I notice something odd. I've been crying. The singer's sagging body is being carried off stage, and I feel dirty. Runnels of tears line my face, broadcasting the pretense of a seduction that never took place. The vital illusion of theater, ordinarily flush with experiences that, aren't, uh, that actually aren't, is now rife with simulated experiences that actually are. Its illusion, now a mere, a more real than real because it's explicated, ex, uh, pardon me. Its illusion, now more real than real because its explicated appearance shows itself to be only what it says it is. It is an illusion. It is exactly as it pretends to be. The scene has swallowed the mirror of appearance, and I am choking on it. How ironic, then, that as I gag on the transparency of the scene, the sheer excessiveness of the real illusion, it occurs to me that this is not only a tape recording. It is a horse. <laughs> the illusion is the horse, a talking horse, and it's telling me that it's not real. The performance are you, I ask, and it responds, exactly. <laughs> Did you know, continues the horse, whose mottled gray coat and frontal bosses puts me in mind of those Spanish breeds used for jumping, that tests were conducted showing THC interferes with our ability to filter out irrelevant stimuli and to suppress certain kinds of responsive actions, actions that are taken typically as evidence of will or intent. I didn't, I say. Indeed, THC induces what the experts call a transient psychosis. And what is one of the chief symptoms of psychosis, the horse asked rhetorically. Auditory hallucination, hearing voices. Like I'm hearing now, I asked mockingly. Mostly, answered the horse. What I'm trying to say is that the relaxation of your response inhibition, however you accomplish it, suggests that much of your time is spent trying not to hear the voice of things, trying not to be lured by the investments that the appearance of vital activity solicits, particularly those which affect an otherness to whom you are subjected and enjoined to pay a kind of exclusive attention. Reflecting on this and then realizing the implication, I said, so you're extrapolating from these studies that we may in fact be living through what's essentially a functional pathology because we seem inclined to hear in a brook's babbling or the wind's whispering an expressive intent, basically granted the horse. But it's not a natural inclination so much as a habit that you symbol-mongering creatures have to indulge a capacity to surpass the given, a capacity that, for your information, we all share. You've just made organic matter's common faculty of drawing from itself more than it contains a second nature and substituting the latter's skein of abstractions for a mythical first. You call the articulation of these abstractions thinking and their distinction meaning. But while I'm wholly pragmatic about my behavior and content to call thinking a style of doing in which certain actions do not denote what those actions for which they stand would denote, you get all fatalistic about which is what. I mobilize incompatible possibilities by doing what I say I'm not doing. What I say, I perform, a par I perform paradox. Pardon me, I'm going to repeat that. I, am, I mobilize incompatible possibilities by doing what I say I'm not doing what I say. I perform paradox. But this co-implication of processual correlates in a single act bends you out of shape. You have a difficult time taking what's said or done as not denoting the things for which they would stand would denote. Things are always meaningful for you, but only if they're always not actually saying or doing what they are not. If you hear voices in the wind, they must either be real voices or not. And if they are real, they must make sense or not. For you, the sound can't be both. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> because the second nature through which you're inclined to live, your patchwork of habits, is a diacritical one. You live meaningfully through crisis, through a separation of possibilities that are held apart by an infinitely thin membrane of what you call sense. Interjecting, I say, but there are times when we do seem to hold, to diff hold different possibilities together in the same instant. Times when crisis is held in suspense. Certainly, said the horse. 
And you either treat it as play or you call it irony, romantic, tragic, cosmic, verbal, situational, and poetic. Don't forget pathetic, I added sarcastically. No, 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 countered the horse. That's a fallacy. The pathetic fallacy, the lyrical inscription of human-like feelings or doings to, on to very unhuman things, such as, for murder, though it have no tongue, will speak with most miraculous organ. Ah, right, Hamlet, Act 2, Scene 2, I noted. Murder doesn't speak, but neither do horses. Personification, said the horse. <laughs> <laughs> How ironic of you, I replied. Not exactly, corrected the horse. It's ventriloquy. A little trick I learned first by listening to the way recordings dissociate sounds from their sources, and then by grasping how this technical affair has produced a generalization of the idea of voice. A generalization of what all pattern sounds stand for, namely sentience. Because of this, I've effectively figured out how to hallucinate a voice. And here's the irony. You have too. You suffer as much as I do from anaphonesis. You see, the tape recording has not only loosed the tongue from the head, but the accent from the tongue. The techniques you've developed first with instruments and voice to hear and sounds, things that aren't actually there, have metastasized to your other senses via the way recordings replace the local sign of the body with the local sign of the sound wave. Recordings have distributed your techniques for abstracting semblances of vitality in sound into other tissues of life by making their techniques a more stable, coherent, and integral part of your ordinary experience. That quality of aliveness you perceive in a chuckle a melodic cook, a sick beat, or even a phatic, uh-huh, is no longer just an oral matter. You've named this splitting schizophrenia, but that's rubbish. Nothing is split. It's simply that the near-complete integration of audio technologies into everyday life has turned musical or vocal utterances into something more adjectival than substantial, something analogous to the effect of valence that pervades any and all situations. The species of expressive detachment of animateness that you count as testament to sentience or aliveness is shown by tape recording to be an effect, a phonostatic effect that is now spread across other sensory domains and their various media. The world of electric definition has indeed made ears of the eyes. And insofar as the ear subtly and actively connives to make, to make what it takes to be sense out of what it hears, the earring of the senses means that anything can, ironically, sing or speak, so to speak. For example, the accent of a seraph in a typeface or the inflection that a lamp makes to the mood of a darkened interrogation room can be understood as a phonostatic effect in that, like background music or chatter, they modulate the effect of tonality of the events, events of reading or questioning that are not exactly alive but are alive-like. They are simulations swollen with vital import. Pardon me, situations swollen with vital imports, import. So what you're saying then, I said, is that your voice is borrowed from my involuntary addiction to expressive intent, that my ear's devotion to significance, or rather my compulsion to constantly source the import of sounds, endows you with the semblance of a voice. Of course, replied the horse. Nothing speaks for itself, not even words. And pausing for a moment, the horse adds, or odd ones for that matter. Absolute ventriloquy is the condition of existence because there's a kind of general expressiv expressivity or physiognomic significance in the form of things that makes their appearances exchangeable. The things themselves aren't exchangeable, but the sense for which they stand is a sense of expression that is not logically discriminated, but is felt as a quality rather than recognized as a function. How do you know this, I asked because it comes straight from the horse's mouth, said the horse. <laughs> and if you've been paying attention, then you'll understand that my mouth is your mouth, I said. Or at least I think I said this, I thought to myself. If absolute ventriloquy is the law, then irony is the rule, and mind can't be its own voice, but only a voice whose drawl shares its expressive force with the way lingering tobacco and vanilla notes express the finish of a small batch bourbon. Yet if it's all a tape recording... Does any of this really matter? Irony is lost when it's forgotten that irony is not the opposite of what it's playing at. When the ludic gesture of wit or satire that inducts us into a register of existence where what matters is no longer what one does, but what one does stands for, irony becomes a law rather than a rule, and thus is no longer office to a playful regime of lived, of lived abstraction or the instantaneous back and forths between logical levels and existential territories that knit dis disparate domains of experience into cartographies of a future life. 
For base of irony, it is all recorded. It is impossible to exchange. There's no meta-ironic equivalent to swap for irony. Meta-irony is just more irony. However, the complete irony of things, if we grasp it as a trans-ironic condition, has a certain sense about it, a superstitious sense. Or rather, the sense of the trans-ironic condition whereby everything says something that does not denote what those standings for which, what those sayings for which they stand would say. <laughs> or rather, the sense of the trans-ironic, the sense of the trans-ironic condition whereby everything says something that does not denote what those sayings for which they stand would denote is hyperstitious. Like a dream whose verisimilitude subsists in the ignorance of its similitude, this hyperstitious purview gives us a way to instrumentalize the strange quality that irony excavates in executing an action and dramatizing it. Not in order to fool ourselves, but to make the soft signs of our second nature sensible and perhaps meaningful. In other words, being hyperstitious lets us take our bullshit seriously. There is no band, yet I hear a band. And someone is singing a familiar song, but I don't know the words. I'm crying and there's a horse telling me that he likes to play. Hands take my wrist and fingers softly trace the poetry of a well-worn tragedy along my arm. A poem. The sensation is like a lullaby. It makes me drowsy. J'entends le parti près des choses, and I begin to dream it wasn't real. It was all a tape recording. Mm -hmm.